And welcome here. Um, what a what a crowd! Never thought we would get this many people here. So I'll press on. I should talk for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll do some questions and answers. All right, so, sounds good. Okay, your captive audience always show pictures of my kids. I get away with it, right? <laughs> All right. So what am I doing? Well, I'm shoveling 36 inches of global warming, right? Okay. So. Um, you know, when I write up columns about, about climate change, I get these really interesting emails the next day, usually at work, and some of the comments are just priceless. I think this one's pretty good. Now, for reasons unknown, you fall and goose-stepped into the wacko liberal global warming, and your credibility is virtually shot, right? And this one is especially kind of rich. Uh, when you write a column like today's, you show yourself to be a corporate shrill. Is it worth a paycheck to sell out your fellow human beings? You disgust me, right? <laughs> so if, if you're gonna write about climate change, you've really gotta have a thick hide, all right? <laughs> Absolutely true. You know, um, as you probably know, Diablo Canyon, Unit 1's decommissioning in 2024, and Unit 2's decommissioning in 2025, and for many years, I was accused of disliking climate change and global warming to try to go for a license extension at Diablo Canyon. Well, folks, that reason is no longer there, right? Because we are decommissioning. So if you think I'm biased because I want to keep my job, you know, I don't have that canard any longer. All right? Does that make sense? <laughs> All right. So why do people are so afraid or, or so upset with, with people who preach about climate change. And from my experience, what it really is, is that there's so many jobs evolved in the fossil fuel industry. There truly are. I was doing a research paper on, okay, if, if Diablo Canyon was a coal fire plant, how, many, how much coal would it take to keep us fired up, right? And it came out to be like 58,000 railroad cars per year. And I dug in deeper into this and figured out, wow, more than half of the business in the railroads in the United States are basically the result of hauling coal, right? So you think the railroads are going to really be big proponents of climate change? Probably not. And really, that example goes on and on and on throughout our society. So no wonder if you, if you threaten people's livelihoods, they're going to get pretty upset. So I, I think a lot of the opposition to climate change is really a, 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 an attack on people's livelihoods. Does that make sense? All right. So science, reconstructing the past, and we could do that by, I, the one that I um, like are, of course, tree, tree rings are, are one way to do that, um, settlement samples, uh, coil, coil. Um, but the best one by far is, is uh, ice core samples, either from Antarctica or from Greenland, because we actually go back hundreds of thousands of years in the past, and there's actually little macroscopic air bubbles that are trapped, trapped in those ice cores, and we could do a chemical analysis and determine what the CO2 levels were. Not only that, but we could actually determine uh, what the temperature was by looking at different isotopes of, of oxygen. All right, it's really fascinating. All right, so this is a graph of CO2 levels uh, for the past uh, half a million years or so. And you can see that overall it stayed below about 300 parts per million regardless. But today it's beyond hockey stick. It's just going straight up. And in fact, we're close to 410 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. So questioning climate change, the seven deadly sins. So the first one is the sun is responsible. It's a natural cycle. Second one, the earth is not warm since 1998. The third one is carbon dioxide is this a trace gas? No worries, we're only talking about parts per million, right? The fourth one is they said it was cooling in the 1970s. Have you all heard that before? It was cooling in the 1970s, all right. Um, it's snowing somewhere, right? It could be snowing in Denver, who knows? And so it can't be getting hotter. And the thermometers are all wrong, right? I've heard that many times. And the climate scientists are just flat out evil. Okay. Um, I took a picture of this, of this billboard in Pennsylvania about two years ago, so I thought I'd throw it up there, right? 
Um, so there are natural variation of, of orbital cycles, and these absolutely do cause climate change. But if you look at lixtacity or elasticity, the, the Earth's orbit is, is not perfect. It does change ar ar around the sun. Um, you have axle tilt. Yep, the, the axle does tilt back and forth and back and forth. And you have precession, uh, which is due to angular velocity. All right? And, but look at the, the timing on these. I mean, one's 100,000 years, 41,000 years, and 23,000 years. That's the key point here, is that these natural variations are very long-term cycles taking place over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years or, or maybe as, you know, 23,000 years. Does that make sense? And these do cause climate change, uh, with, without a doubt. So with that being said, is it the sun? And Ray has done a lot of studies on the sun, of course, for the field, his vocation. And we have a lot of satellites in orbit that can measure the sun's radiation. And overall, the, the amount of radiation, even with sunspot cycles every 11 years, really hasn't changed that much. So we run these in the models. This is the variations in the sound output, but we're still seeing temperature increase, all right? Um, is it the Earth's orbit? But once again, those cycles that I spoke about earlier are from 100,000 years to 23,000 years. So if you just look at since the 1880s, now the sun's orbit hasn't really contributed to the increase in, in air temperatures. Um, could it be volcanoes? Because when a volcano erupts like Mount St. Helen up in Washington, it does put in a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere and also a lot of aerosols that can actually cause global cooling, believe it or not. But we took all that data and sure enough, really not a, not a lot of difference. And uh, then we took all three and combined them and still there wasn't enough forcing there to really um, you know, justify what was going on with, with the increasing temperatures of the atmosphere and, and the ocean. So no slowdown in global warming. Uh, you can see since 1940, we're just going up, up, and up. In fact, 2014 was the warmest year on record, and sure enough, 2015 was actually warmer than 2014, and then 2016 was actually warmer than 2015, believe it or not. And absolutely, El Nino's playing a part in this, right? But we've had very, very strong El Nino's in the past, like in 70s, oh, 1997, 1998, 1982, and 1983, that were pretty much just almost as strong, if not a little bit stronger. So there, there you go. All right, it's just a trace gas. But think of it this way, each molecule of CO2 is like a feather and a down comforter helping to trap heat in the atmosphere, all right? So, you know, as I said before, 400 parts per million, if that was carbon monoxide, currently none of us would be here right now, right? We'd all be poisoned. Now, I love this painting, it's called American Gothic, and it was painted during the Depression years, right? But looking at this painting, um, they're probably not drinking much alcohol, all right? <laughs> but if you got a commercial driver's license, I'm just saying that if you have a blood alcohol content of 400 parts per million, you just lost your license and you'll probably spend the night in jail, all right? So even though it's a trace gas, it does have profound effects. All right, they said it was cooling in the 1970s. So I saw this... Um, this picture, I said, oh, that's really weird. On the cover of Time Magazine, Time of, the cover of Time Magazine, wow, it's cooling, right? And if you read the date here, it says 1976. So I, go, so I dug into it a little bit deeper, right? And lo and behold, in 2006, there was this cover. It says, The Global Warming Survival Guide. So what they did, they, they just took, you know, the Ice Age is coming, and they just transformed it, right? So it was never on the cover of Time magazine. The, the article that so many people um, referenced to was really a, was, a, was like a three-paragraph article in Newsweek magazine. It wasn't even on the cover, all right? So only, what, the point I'm trying to make is only a few scientists prescribes to the notion that we're seeing global cooling. The vast majority of scientists, in fact, 97% believe that, yep, the Earth is warming and that we're causing it, all right? 
All right, this theory or this hypothesis has been around for, for centuries now, and it's not new. Um, this is from a newspaper from 1912. And if you can't read this, this is what it says. The furnaces of the world are now burning about two billion tons of coal each year. When this is burned, uh, uniting with oxygen, it adds about seven billion tons of CO2 or carbon dioxide to the atmosphere yearly. Uh, this trends to make, or this tends to make the air more efficient blanket uh, for the earth and to raise its temperatures. The effects may not be considerable, in, or may be considerable in the next few centuries. This is 1912, they were writing about this. All right, so it's snowing somewhere, so it cannot be getting hotter, right? So the way I look at this is that weather is one play in a baseball game, but climate is really the history of the entire Major League Baseball, all right? Or another way to look at this, uh, this is a yearly temperature plot from actually Washington National Airport. And yeah, for the one year graphs, you see a lot of variations, right? But then when you get to the the three-year cycle starts smoothing out, and once you get to the 30-year the trend, yeah, it's pretty smooth here on the line, but you can see there's a tremendous amount of variation, right? So that's the difference between weather and climate. Does that all make sense? All right. So the thermometers are all wrong. For 10 years, heck, I took care of all the temperature, oceanographic temperature recorders at Diablo Canyon along the Pecho Coast. We have 34 temperature monitoring stations. And I did the calibrations. We would calibrate to about a thousandth of a degree Celsius, believe it or not. And Einar Anderson, who just passed away last month, was a Caltech um, graduate, and he showed me how to do this. So we have a very meticulous and powerful marine temperature database at Diablo Canyon. All right? Something I'm really proud of. And you know, the two previous all-time temperature readings occurred 66.65 in 83 and 66.72 in 97. By the way, those are two very strong El Nino events. But look what happened a couple of years ago. In October 2015, seawater temperature reached 67.58 degrees. I would have never thought that we would see seawater temperatures of that magnitude along our coastline. All right, and you got to remember that water is 1,000 times denser, has 1,000 times the heat capacity than air does. So if you're seeing increasing temperatures of this magnitude in the ocean, truly the you know the globe really is is warming. All right. Okay. So sea ice tells the story. So the Nautilus was the first ship to make it to the North Pole, and that occurred in August of 1958. And they tried to get up there in June, but the ice was too thick. They tried again in July, and the ice was too thick. But finally in August, they were able to get underneath the North Pole and break through the ice cap. All right? So since that time, the Navy's kept meticulous records on ice thickness up in, up in the Arctic. So I'm going to show a little video showing what's, what's been going on lately. So here we go. All right. So... Here's a graph of ice thickness up in the Arctic Ocean, uh, beginning back in 1978. And you can see, yep, yeah, some years it goes up, and some years it goes down, some years it goes up, and some years it goes down. Now, I've had people, ever heard the, the term cherry picking before when they try to argue their position? And so often, well, you know, you know, 1991 through like 1994, look, the ice thickness was actually increasing quite a bit, in fact. So I, I just don't buy this hypothesis of, of climate change. I, I, I think you're all feeding us, uh, you know, you know what, right? And, but if one looks at the long-term trends, this is what you got to do. Don't look at it a couple of years. Don't look at 10 years. Look at the long-term trends to actually see what's going on. That's when you get a good idea of, of actually, you know, what's going on with climate change. And you can see, yep, some years it goes up, some years the ice thickness decreases, some years it increases. But overall, you can see what the overall trend's been doing, right? It's been going down and going down quite a bit. All right. And by the way, this year could be the all-time record for, 
for the least amount of ice up in the Arctic. So let me get back to my little PowerPoint here. And I spent two years in Alaska mining for gold, in Chicken, Alaska of all places, outside of Dawson City. And I'm always amazed by the glaciers up in that part of the world. And later on, when I was in the Navy, I was in an air crew in a P-3 Orion Maritime Patrol aircraft. And going to Japan, we would fly the Great Circle, so we'd fly up to Alaska, right, get gas, then fly back down to Japan. And all the crew members, we had like 13 folks in our crew, and all of them commented about how much the glaciers up in Alaska have been shrinking from your, just your own eyeballs. You don't have to be a scientist to figure this one out. And this is Muir Glacier, and, and look at the difference just over about 40 years or so. It's really remarkable. Um, in Japan, you know, rice is a big deal, right? But another big deal is cherry blossoms. I mean, they have a whole cherry blossom festival. And this graph actually shows that the cherry blossoms are blooming earlier and earlier every year, pretty much, which means it's getting warmer and the cherry blossoms are coming out earlier. Now, these are two students at Cal Poly and I was talking with Denise Taylor. She didn't want me to mention this in my column, so I didn't, right? Because they're still um, compounding data. They capture rattlesnakes, male rattlesnakes, to be Pacific, and they implant a little chip in them. And the chip, number one, it records body temperature, but it also records their GPS, their lat longs, so they get movements on these rattlesnakes. And what they've noticed is these male rattlesnakes are becoming more active earlier in the year looking for a mate. So this is kind of some local, local examples here. Okay, this is a good one. You cannot even predict tomorrow's weather, let alone 100 years from now, right? Which is true. You know, I'll, I'll blow weather forecasts all, all the time. But if you look at long-term trends, you know, sometimes it's difficult to predict the rain. But if somebody asked me, okay, John, what's the weather going to be like 50 years from now in Avila Beach in the month of July? And I'll go, well, chances are it'll probably be foggy, right? <laughs> all right, so those are long-term trends. All right, um, the computer models are not good enough to really tell us what will happen, and I'll tell you, they are more than good enough, and they're getting better every single year. This up the coast, about 90 miles, is the Fleet Numerical Center, and it's right by the postgraduate school, and they have some of the most powerful computers on the face of the earth, and their models keep getting better and better and better. And the problem is, is they're verifying to a greater and greater degree every year. So we're getting a lot of confidence in their output. All right, the climate scientists are all trying to achieve worldwide domination, AKA Dr. Evil, right? And, and a lot of, for some reason, a lot of people think this. But you know, it's interesting, if somebody has a PhD in science, generally speaking, they can make a lot more money in the private sector than they can in academia, right? or in government service. All right, so sea level increase. Now, I got these next two slides from Josh Willis from JPL in, in um, Southern California and Pasadena. And when sea ice melts, it really doesn't do anything because ice is one of those amazing molecules that when it expands, or when it freezes, it actually expands. When it goes from a liquid phase to a solid phase, it expands. I don't know of any other molecule on the face of the Earth that does that. Maybe, maybe Michelle may come up with one, but that's the only one that I know of. So it's like an iceberg. You know, 90% of the iceberg is below the water line, 10% 10, 10 is above. So when it melts, it doesn't really increase sea level. However, when you have melting land ice, that certainly increases sea level. And then when you have iceberg calving, that increases sea level. So here's a plot, and this starts in 1880 through present, and this is a composite of all the tide gauges throughout the world, including one tide gauge at Point Forts underneath the Golden Gate Bridge that was installed in 1849 during the gold rush years, all right? So if you drew a line from 1880 to present, the average rate of sea level increase is about 1.8 millimeter per year. If you went back to the 1880s to the 1930s, about 0.8 millimeters per year. If you went from the 1920s to the 1980s, about 2 millimeters per year. 
and lately it's shot up to about 3.2 millimeters per year. A lot of this sea level increase is due to thermal expansion in basically the upper layers of the ocean. The ocean's getting warmer. When the water warms, it expands. So a lot of the sea level increase is really contributed to thermal expansion, all right? I know it doesn't sound like a lot. What are you guys talking about? However, if for some reason you had a big storm with a lot of storm runoff and high tide and storm surge, on top of large wind-generated waves, then this could really become significant for a lot of coastal communities. Now, PG&E, the company that I work for, we brought together some of the finest scientists in the world because we had a, ch a climate change conference. And because a lot of our facilities are actually located at sea level or near sea levels, so really worried about this. And we choose to go with this trend line, the one in black. And so we feel by the year 2100 that we'll probably see about 47 inches of, of sea level increase here in California. 47 inches? About 47 inches. All right. All right. Now, um, and that's significant for Caltrans also. I mean, they've got to try to maintain our roads, especially those, those roads near the Pacific Ocean. Air temperature change. So once again, the trend line that we're going to go with is, is right here in this band. And we're thinking by the year 2100, we'll probably see about six, degree, six degrees Fahrenheit temperature increase. So it's hard to fathom, isn't it? That much temperature increase. All right. Oh, Pat, there's a picture of Pat Mullen right here with the fire console, right? <laughs> so... Um, of course, we're really worried about wildfires. And we think by the year 2050, we'll probably see a 300% increase in wildfires. And that's because of, of, of warmer temperatures and maybe more intense droughts, all right? So on the flip side of droughts are a thing called atmospheric rivers. Ever heard of these? People used to call them pineapple expresses because they would basically uh, begin near the Hawaiian Islands right about here. Um, in meteorological circles, we say turn it on the hose, okay? And even though this is water vapor, this is water vapor, it can actually transport more water than the Amazon River can, or five times as much as the Mississippi River could, all right? And as Ray was saying last Sunday, and this is a simple law of physics, Michelle could contest to this, is that the warmer the atmosphere, the more water vapor it could contain. It's a simple law of physics, you can't argue it, right? The warmer the atmosphere, the more water vapor. And when that water vapor condenses, it releases latent heat. And when it releases latent heat, especially in the mid-levels of, of the atmosphere, that's really the engine that drives storms, all right? So this AR occurred in December of 2010 and we had about 12 inches or so in about 48 hours, and that's when Guadalupe and Oceano had all really severely flooded, right? But we think back in 1862, there might have been another AR, and this one produced over 100 inches in one month. And the consequences of that, this is a picture of Sacramento, believe it or not. This is 4th Street and K Street, all right? And the capital had to be moved for a short time to San Francisco. There is a United States um, geographic boat off the coast of San Francisco, and they said there was a plume of fresh water extending out to the Farallon Islands because there was so much water coming out of the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River, right? All right, so what is pg &E doing? And I think Ray might have showed this slide um, last week about where's all the CO2 coming from. And right now, transportation, it, you know, it used to be electrical generation was a big part of this. And this is from 2015. But you can see that transportation really is the biggest part of the pie. And here's kind of a, a bit of good news. If you look at the Topaz Solar Farm in the Criso Plains and Diablo Canyon Power Plant, you know, this county exports more clean energy than anybody else does, than any other county in the United States. We, I did some quick calculations on this. We export about 20,000 gigawatt hours a year in carbon-free energy out of this county, believe it or not. Isn't that remarkable? 
Now this is our energy mix, and this is what it looked like in 2015. About 42% of the electricity we generated was from natural gas-fired plants, all right? And I put, this is 2016, I, I put down 2020 projected. This is what we're hoping we're gonna be at for AB32. But we're already there. In fact, last year we we're already there. And, and look how natural gas went from 42% down to 30%. So last year, about 70% of the electricity we delivered to our customers was carbon free. I mean, that is remarkable. And this year, this year it's gonna be even higher. You know, maybe, maybe get up there towards 80% or so. So it's, it's, it's really, really a remarkable story to say the least. So, two years ago, pg and &E gave me a thousand dollar incentive as an employee to install solar panels in my house, so I did, right? But remember I told you transportation's really our, our biggest emitter of greenhouse gases today, by far, especially in California. Um, pg and &E gave me a, uh, sold me a Ford Focus for $8,100, so I bought it. And then I also have a Nissan Leaf. So we used to pump about $321 per month in gasoline. Today we just drive past gas stations. We don't pump gasoline anymore. And since I have solar panels, and you saw how clean the electricity is coming on the grid, I don't think I have much of a footprint, of a carbon footprint any longer. It may just be about neutral, right? I, in fact, um, I think I'll actually produce more electricity than I consume, believe it or not, in my house, all right? All right, I, I want to leave you with this. Is the first person in space, right? Yuri. And when Yuri got up there, he was shocked. He was shocked by how thin the atmosphere was. If I had a red delicious apple and chopped it in half, the white flesh would represent the earth and the red skin would represent the thickness of the atmosphere. It is immensely thin. You wouldn't think about that, but that's what really shook him up. So absolutely, um, our activities are contributing to climate change. There's just no doubt in my mind. All right? And with that, if you ever want to follow me on Twitter, there's my Twitter account. I always put a lot of cool stuff on there. So there you go. I just want to say what an honor and privilege it is to be able to, to speak to such a great group, and especially here at such a, such a beautiful church. So thank you so much.